Minimal invasive procedures have become very popular. Minimally invasive equals minimal results. There's more facelift done now than ever. Buckle fat removal surgery. Once they start looking at their nose, they find a defect. First time she wants it up. Second time she wants to go back and she did down again. And now it looks like, mm, I want to actually have my natural nose back. Hello and welcome to another episode of Khan Clinics, powered by the health section of American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan. Today, we have a unique guest from the field of reconstructive surgery. Dr. Tang Ho is a physician in facial and plastic surgery. He currently serves as the chief of facial plastic reconstructive surgery and is the assistant professor in the department of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at UT Health McGovern Medical School in Houston. His specialties include aesthetic, reconstructive surgery of the face, which ranges from facial rejuvenation procedures like facelift, Botox injections, to complex facial reanimation out for facial paralysis and reconstructive surgery after skin cancer. In addition to his medical degree from John Hopkins, he holds a master's from the University of Edinburgh in sociology. He's double board certified. He's recognized with numerous honors, including the faculty member of the year award, McGovern's Medical School Dean's Teaching Excellent Award, and the Castle Connolly Top Doctors Award. Dr. Tang, welcome to the show and the podcast. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan. It's a pleasure to be here. Look forward to having a lively discussion. Dr. Tong, we'll start off today with the, uh, the topic of how people's demands have changed regarding facial rejuvenation, reconstructive surgery. And naturally looking results, minimally invasive surgery is ever so much on the rise. Can you give us a bit of an insight about the approach creating these subtle, naturally looking results in facial rejuvenation procedures, Botox and facelift? So yeah, though, thank you for that question. I think that's often something that we certainly get asked about a lot. And nowadays, a lot of our patients, potential clients and so on, you know, people have seen these, you know, horror plastic surgery stories on like, you know, there are these shows, shows like botched and so on. And, and rightfully so, I think a lot of people are becoming very wary about something that's all natural. So the key word that, you know, that everyone's looking for, we want a kind of natural, refreshed and kind of appearance. But at the same time, I think, as you've kind of alluded to earlier, there's a balance that needs to be stricken in trying to achieve a natural result as well as a visible result, mm -hmm. right? That's something that I think that really kind of gets, can be a tricky sometimes because mm -hmm. now natural, if you think about it, the aging is a natural process, right? But when you're looking for facial rejuvenation, you are essentially looking to reverse that clock a bit. And that is by definition, not a natural process. Time is only moving in one direction. And we are trying to make our patients essentially give our clients a more youthful, rejuvenated look. So that in itself is a bit of, can almost be seen as a bit of a paradox, I think, interestingly in itself. So because our patients are looking for a natural result, but at the same time, they want a visible improvement. And I think that is something that really needs to be kind of discussed with the patient, how much they're comfortable with doing, and uh, because what may be perceived as a natural result by one person may be seen as very, very little to no difference by another. Right. And so though these are those are all things kind of we approach a client and patient and, and try to kind of get an idea what the patient is looking for. Excellent. Thank you for that explanation, uh, Dr. Ho. Tell us a little bit about what are the limitation and what side effects do you caution the patient about? So obviously we worry as far as the side effects for surgery, you know, they're depending on the type of surgery, right? So there's always some scarring, some swelling that occurs right after the surgery. We explain to the patient that to expect, you know, a certain amount of recovery time, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really important to kind of set the expectations uh, beforehand. And especially for certain type of procedures, for example, like a rhinoplasty, 
agency. The standard spiel that we tell everybody is that you really need to give about a year for really the results to mature. That's not to say the nose is going to be big and swollen for the whole year, but you really take some time for it to kind of settle in and essentially achieve the final result. And that is only going to depend a little bit patient's individual protoplasm a little bit as well, right? So for example, patients who have thin skin is going to essentially have a quicker recovery. The swelling is going to go away quicker mm -hmm. versus someone with thicker skin type. And then you'll have to counsel them appropriately because it will take a little bit longer time for that swelling to get better um, and so on. Excellent. Thank you for that explanation. Minimal invasive procedures have become very popular. How do you incorporate them in your practice? Yeah, so minimally nowadays, we're seeing just this huge explosion of minimally invasive procedures, right? Mm -hmm. Anything from, and the other thing is there's new ones that come out all the time. Right. And I think, you know, especially nowadays with social media, internet, and so on, with all the marketing that's out there, I think it's so difficult for patients and for people who are interested in that to really you know you see something some amazing before and after and then the next thing you think about oh you know that's for me and there's a lot to be said about it and then I think again it always comes back to expectations you know one of the things that you know we often kind of talk about as surgeons we half jokingly say that you know minute Minimally invasive equals minimal results, right? It's a little bit of a joke in a sense, but there's a lot of true setting jest as well to a certain extent, right? So I think if minimally invasive uh, means are able to achieve everything that we want to do in facial rejuvenation and in plastic surgery, then people like us would not be in business anymore, right? But if anything, there's more facelift done now than ever. And uh, so clearly surgery is not going away, but minimally invasive means certainly have their place. There's no question about it. And I think the advantage of being a plastic surgeon is that we, um, I think to a certain extent, have the advantage of can have all the tools box at our disposal. One of the favorite things I like to remind my trainees, our residents and I also have a facial plastic surgery fellow as well. And one of the things I'd like to kind of remind them is that if you only have a hammer, then everything's a nail, right? Mm -hmm. So if you only have a limited set of tool, you're gonna try to essentially squeeze and try to fit the problem into the tools that you have. And, and that obviously can have a limitation on the results that you can achieve. Right. So, so there's certainly a role for minimally invasive procedures. For example, you know, someone maybe in their 20s and 30s who has a, who have a little bit of looseness in the neck that they would like a little bit of tightening, for example. Is that someone that you would do a facelift for? Eh, most likely not, right? So right. that would be someone that we might consider something like radial frequency, like a face tight, or even something like a cervical liposuction, even something like injectable, like Hybella. And I think that would be very appropriate for that particular patient. But on the other hand, in the contrary, if you have someone who, and I actually get this a lot because I'm a trainer for thread lift as well as so I train other doctors how to do this minimal invasive thread lift. And often we'll have patients who are, are older and who have maybe a lot of laxity and a lot of excess skin and they will come and they would want to have a thread lift. And those patients, I would tell them that, you know, it's not that you can't have the thread lift, but it's not likely to give you the result that you're looking for because they're just too much skin for you really need a facelift surgery. So. So I think that's where kind of roughly, I think as an example where how these things can fit in. Sure. We will move on to discuss a little bit of the role of laser treatment 
and this is one of the newer technologies along with robotics. Give us a, a little bit of an insight. Where do we stand as far as laser and robotics is with plastic uh, reconstructive surgery? Has it got any role? What's the limitation? What would you suggest to the audience here? So laser has been has been around for, for quite a bit, at least as long as I have been um, in training even before that. But um, what has really kind of changed with laser or all these energy-based devices is from what I have seen is not so much the actual means the, the actual kind of a technology itself but how uh, it is actually delivered for example so so things like radio frequency and laser and so on it's it's actually you know the laser you have a co2 laser you have in the Yag laser you have a Xandri laser I mean those laser have been around for a while and, and then they're still the same kind of laser but but what has really kind of advanced is how the laser is delivered for example uh, back in the days with a traditional laser delivery device there is a pretty long extended recovery time Right. And because, you know, essentially the way it does is just basically just peel off the entire layer of skin, right? Because essentially the laser creates a burn. But nowadays, you know, you have a fractionated laser. So essentially the laser is still delivered. It's the same kind of laser, but it's delivered in this fractionated pattern. Right. So the laser is spaced out on the face so that you have essentially area of untreated skin and then treated the skin so that allows the recovery to be quicker and then as far as robotics go primarily the role is more in reconstructive surgery as far as i'm aware of you know when it comes to aesthetic surgery we're not really kind of utilizing robotics that much per se because that does add to extra cost as well for the patients and uh, there hasn't to my knowledge a lot of utilization of robots in aesthetic surgery but in reconstructive surgery especially in the head and neck surgery area where the reconstruction can be in areas for example deep down the throat where the access is a little bit more limited Robots have had some roles in that. Thank you. Thanks for that explanation. We'll move on swiftly to the next favorite topic that's been put on top of the list. Buckle fat removal surgery. Since its social yeah. media exploded, this form of surgery, everyone has put in this question. What's your thoughts? Give us an insight. And we're not asking who you performed it on, but give us a little bit of insight on this. Yeah, so it's very prevalent in the social media world, right? So there certainly is a role for it. Also, you know, I think there's also been a lot of social media feeds and stories about how people look just kind of gaunt after buckle fat removal, right? Right. So the thing with buckle fat removal that is supposed to make your face essentially look thinner right more sculpted look correct now for people with certain type of facial shape and mm -hmm. who have kind of really essentially fuller cheek and so on maybe more of a round facial shape the buckle fat removal can be an effective way of kind of essentially create a shape of a face that we generally consider maybe more aesthetically attractive like an oval or or egg or almond depending on how you describe it but but the problem is it's in, when when you take the fat out in people who are maybe not really don't really perhaps really quote unquote needed right so meaning that they weren't really that puffy or full to begin with in their cheek then you can end up with kind of this really almost gaunt and to me almost too sculpted it almost looks a little malnourished type of look okay so as with all aesthetic surgery options you really have to kind of essentially choose the right patients right so so okay. people who are really kind of suitable for that for that treatment and the other thing is that with buckle fat removal it doesn't really regenerate that much so once it's removed it takes it takes a long time if at all for it to come back and uh, and the thing is, as you get older, if your buckle fat has been removed, one of the things that a lot of time we do as you get older is that we try to give you more volume, 
as well, right? So if you've lost all that volume when you're young, as you get older, that can essentially set you back a little bit further behind as you get older as far as the volume depletion uh, is concerned. So you mentioned malnourishment, the face looking a little bit, you mentioned irreversibility of the procedure, buccal fat cut. What are the other complications one should be worried about when you're performing this uh, procedure and the risk you explain to your patient? So the buccal, fortunately, it's a relatively low risk procedure. I would say that probably the biggest risk is probably removing too much fat. Okay. Now, generally, these are done through an intraoral incision. It's an incision that's inside the mouth. Um, the incision generally is very close to the, um, the essentially, the, uh, uh, the duct where the parotid gland drains saliva. Mm -hmm. So you're making an incision that essentially potentially could, that potentially could cause injury to that duct. So that would be one of the risks. And also you're close to some facial vessels as well. Mm -hmm. One of the branches of the facial artery doesn't come across in that area. Right. So bleeding would be a concern as well. But I would say, but those are generally for any surgeon who is competent and who knows what they're doing. Those are, you're not really at too much risk in that area. I would say the main risk really is in the potential risk of uh, removing out too much fat. Dr. Tang, what would you tell or advice give to the younger group that is coming out and wants this procedure done? I think the, my best advice would be find someone that you trust that can give you an honest assessment um, whether or not the buccal fat really removal is really indicated will really benefit you. I think finding uh, a surgeon that you can trust to give you an honest assessment, I think that is probably the most most important thing because the procedure is not a difficult procedure. It's uh, any plastic surgeon can perform this, but you really want to kind of get an objective assessment as with any cosmetic procedure on whether or not this is something going to really benefit you. Thank you for clarification. We'll move on to rhinoplasty, nasal reconstructive surgery. It's one of the sought out procedures in facial surgery. Jumping on to the first question, explain to us how aesthetic desires balance with functional requirements and how do we approach to maintain this balance? So, you know, form and function are the thing are the things that we're always looking to achieve in rhinoplasty or septal rhinoplasty, right? So so a lot of this comes to again on whether or not there's some existing breathing issues to begin with, sure. right? So um, if you have a deviated septum, you have some problem breathing to begin with, a lot of times that, you know, what would be best for you would be to have um, a septal surgery as well at the same time, right? And a lot of my patients who come for breathing problems will usually end up uh, choosing to have a rhinoplasty at the same time because we're already there in the nose. We're working in the region. Actually, I looked at this myself. I would say for my patients, probably around 70% of my patients who come for a functional nasal issue will end up having the functional surgery as well as the cosmetic external rhinoplasty at the same time. And when we perform a rhinoplasty, whether it's cosmetic only or one that is functional and cosmetic in nature, the key is really not to remove too much cartilage. And the evolution of the rhinoplasty over the years, really, if you look at how the rhinoplasty has been performed, like say 30, 40, 40 years ago, is really primarily a reductive surgery or reductive process, right? So the goal is to essentially, you know, another one of my saying, you know, like to what I tell my residents is that in facial plastic surgery, we're aiming to essentially do a smaller nose, bigger eyes, and tighter skin. Mm -hmm. Those are essentially three things that <laughs> probably covers 99% of what we do in facial plastic surgery. Mm, okay. A smaller nose, a bigger eyes, and then tighter skin. So say 34 years ago, like the, the rhinoplasty really was kind of really thought of as a primarily a reductive process. So the goal is to, you know, remove all the cartilage, make the skin essentially 
just let everything essentially contract down and then you're gonna end up with a very small nose right obviously you know once you take out a lot of their supporting structure for the nose which is made of cartilage then you're gonna end up with a smaller nose but the problem with that is that it collapses so much that you end up having problem breathing right so and that can become an issue for a lot of patients if they end up having too much cartilage resected sure. so now the emphasis is not to just all now obviously in order to make the nose smaller you have to remove something right you got to remove some cartilage but the key now is to not just remove but also to make sure that in the process of trimming the cartilage we're also re-establishing support to the nose as well and most of the time we do that by using the cartilage that's in there already in the nose, usually from the septum. Essentially put it back in the nose, uh, some parts of it, and then use it as a way to reestablish support to the nose. Excellent. Literally every person I've asked to look in the mirror has, once they start looking at their nose, they find a defect. And how do you manage expectations of people coming in and saying, oh, if I look at my nose, it's not right, doctor. Dr. Tang, no. how do you approach those patients? Or what do you say? And how do you select your group of patients you want to treat? Yes. So, you know, Dr. Khan, that's a very good question. You know, it's a, the, the truth of the matter is what I, what, I tell my, what I tell my patients, potential clients, is that at the end of the day, there's no such thing as perfection. And uh, if you are going to, it's, you're just exactly like what you said. There's always that you're always going to find something, right? You can always find something that you can probably make better. Okay. Okay. So, so when it comes to that, um, when we're talking about something like the rhinoplasty, then and a lot of times that you know, number one, we we talk about that, right? And the other thing is that it really is important to set very specific goals what we want to achieve right so most common being shaving down the dorsal hump right refinement of the nasal tip so those are very common uh, requests probably like 80 90 percent what we do is dorsal hump reduction tip refinement and to some extent as well so alar base reduction to make the nostrils smaller a lot of time you know straining out the septum as well and now like like I mentioned, there's no such thing as perfection, but the surgery obviously has to deliver improvement, right? So, and the goal is to set very specific goals. It's like, okay, today we're gonna really kind of talk about what we're gonna focus on kind of doing this, like say a pump reduction, tip refinement, and we also use morphing, essentially like a imaging, more essentially kind of Photoshop software to kind of show patients, potential clients, what potentially could be achieved and make sure that it's in congruence is what uh, our patient and client is kind of looking for, right? So that's also a tool that's going to be very helpful in kind of letting someone see what they're looking for whether or not that um, is perhaps what they really think they'll be happy with because a lot of times you see these uh, social media or you know web pictures say oh you know that nose looks great but the thing is is that nose gonna look good on your face right, right? and the morphing software the photoshopping that we do so for all rhinoplasty patients we always have a session beforehand so where we kind of go through that because you want to be able to see what you're thinking you're the nose that you're going to have is really going to look good like on your face so even though the simulation that the photo simulation we do even though it is not like a hundred and we always are very cold it's not guaranteed what it's going to look like but it's and as a more of a communication tool to, to discuss with the patients. Excellent. A tough question. When I have one of the friends who would go come back to me literally like every second, third month. She would go in and have her nose done. First time she go in, she wants it up. Second time she said, oh, I've had it up. Now I'm going to go back and have it down again. So she wants to go back and she did go back and had it down again. She's still not happy. And then she went again and had third surgery to her nose. Right. And now it looks like, mm, I want to actually have my natural nose back. How do you manage those patients, which are always going to be challenging, coming back to you and are requesting for repeated surgeries? 
and yeah. never happy or yeah. always finding some sort of fault with an, or want yeah. improvement. Yeah, you're exactly right. So those are very obviously, you know, and that's what we talk about, like body plastic surgery, you know, textbooks, we talk about BDD or body dysmorphic disorder, right? So, you know, one of the things that they, they tell you, they teach you, and now I'm teaching my, my trainees is that, you know, when you're, and I've been practiced now for like you know, about 15, 15 years now. So the, uh, they always tell you that, you know, first thing you learn is you learn how to operate first, right? And then you learn who to operate on. The last thing you learn is who not to operate on. So patients such as, you know, like someone that you're describing, as you mentioned, is challenging, right? So I think the key first is to keep an open channel of communication, right? So I think to have an open channel of communication, listen to these patients, right? And want our patients to be happy. Right. I mean, that, that all of us do, as you mentioned, but sometimes that just may not be possible. And at some point that you may have to just be honest and upfront and say, I have done everything that I can, that I think are reasonable. Perhaps that, you know, I may not be the best physician to deliver the results that you're looking for. I think at some point you do have to. You have to draw a line, I guess, at that because she's going to keep on coming. And as soon as I tell about tell about you, she's going to be knocking at your door to, to get some advice. <laughs> well, I look forward to that. Facial paralysis, a serious yes. topic. Um, you've worked, done some work on it and facial reanimation procedures. Doctor Who, give us a little bit of insight about that and how does that help the patients? Yeah, it's it's an area that I'm, I'm very, very interested in. I've been doing it for a long time. And the reason why I really enjoy working with, with facial paralysis patients is a difficult problem, obviously. And mm. it's a very socially debilitating it issue, is. right? So Absolutely. When, you're, when your face is not, you wear your face every day, right? Yeah. So versus my plastic surgery colleagues who uh, do body, uh, you know, surgeries and uh, which, you know, right. obviously are very important as well. But with whatever you do on your body, you can hide with clothing, right? Versus right. your face, you know, at least some parts of your face have to be exposed no matter what, right? right. <laughs> Every day. So Absolutely. You, you may choose to cover and then certain parts of the face you may have to cover, but you know, some parts of have to be exposed, right? So and you wear your face every day. What I really enjoy working on in facial, in the treatment of facial paralysis, there are a lot of different options available okay. and varies from something as simple as like a facelift type of procedure okay. where essentially you're tightening the skin, pulling the, the lip tight, which is a relatively small procedure, to something that we do where we transplant muscle from your leg that includes the blood vessel and the nerve to essentially try to bring movement to the face again. Okay. And that's a big surgery, like six to eight hours. You'll be in the hospital probably about three to five days afterwards for us to kind of monitor the flap. There is just a plethora of different options that are available to our facial paralysis patients. Okay. And the best treatment option for the patient that is in question really depends on the very individualized, tailored treatment plan that has to, number one, take into account what the etiology okay. of the facial paralysis is. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, how long it's gonna has it been there? The duration, and lastly, but certainly not the least, how much does the patient wish to do? Okay. Sure. So these are really three things that are going to dictate what the best option for the patient is. Right. So for someone, for example, who has the facial nerve cut or severed, whether it's due to cancer or trauma. Sure. that has been paralyzed for more than a year, that would be like a bore, or this would be like a bore question that we would have on plastics board. It was like, what would be the best option, right? So someone who has the nerve who's cut, where you know it's kind of coming back, who's been there for a long time, and the nerve, then the muscle itself has atrophy. So if you just reconnect the nerve, it's not going to do anything because right. the muscle has wasted away already, mm -hmm. right? So the textbook answer for that would be, well, this person needs a free muscle flap, like a gracilis free flap, 
essentially a muscle transplant. But what if the patient doesn't want to have such a big surgery, right? So right. kind of going back to what we were talking about as far as minimally invasive procedures and so on, you know, for whatever reason, they may not want to have a 10 hour surgery. Well, then, then what do you do, right? So then, you know, you have to kind of, you have to take that into account. And then, so maybe a limited lifting procedure, right? Uh, or a sling procedure, in that case, may be the correct answer, right? Because even though the textbook answer will be like, well, you know, they really need a muscle free, but that's that's not what the, the patient desires. And you have to listen to what the patient's wishes are and then kind of adapt your uh, treatment plan according. Right. Well, thank you for that answer. That explains it. Our next topic is about cancer. You mentioned a little bit about that on the face is particularly debilitating like it is if you have facial paralysis. Um, give us the challenges that one faces or you face when you're doing reconstructive surgery after a skin cancer removal particularly if it's very visible on the face, Dr. Hu. Yeah. So obviously on the face, um, you know, the aesthetics are important, right? So I, I think that goes without question. But I think something that may not be immediately obvious as a challenge on facial reconstruction, and this is something I like to actually quiz my uh, trainees, is that you really have to pay attention on what the effect of your proposed reconstruction is on the surrounding facial structure. Mm -hmm. okay? Because you don't have a ton real estate to work with on the face, right? right? Say you have a cheek skin cancer and you had that removed and you're going to reconstruct that defect or hole in the cheek with some skin that's going to be pulled up to essentially move in to close the hole. Is that area, what is your cheek close to? Well, it's very close to your eyes, right? So if you're pulling the skin to close the cheek from around the eye area, you end up going to potentially cause a different problem by causing like say ectropion where your lid is retracted down like this, right? And that certainly is not something that you want, right? Because number one, aesthetically, that's not good. Number two, it also makes it difficult for you to close your eye, which in itself can cause a different problem as well. So uh, when you do facial reconstruction, and then the same thing can be said that, you know, if the defect, you know, going back to that same example where it may be a little bit closer to the side, closer to the lip, and then depending on which part of the facial skin that you're moving to try to close that, you may end up distorting the, the lip structure in the self, right? So, so that is another consideration that you need to, to think about when you're doing facial reconstruction. And obviously, the other th some other things related to that would be, uh, you know, the color match of the skin, right? Because if you're going to do something like a skin graft, uh, you're taking skin from somewhere else, but the match of the, so the skin graft may work okay, but, but the color match of the skin, say you take it from your arm, from your thigh, may be a lot paler than what you have on this, on the face. So even though the skin graft can cover the hole, it may end up looking not so aesthetically pleasing, right? So you may end up looking like a bandage, like a permanent bandage that's on your face. And that could be very stressful for, you know, for someone to, to have that and be conscientious about it. So a lot of times we may like to do what we call like a local flap where we move to try to use, utilize some of the skin from around the face to try to close that defect. Excellent. Thank you very much for that explanation. Dr. Ho, give us the new innovations that are on the horizon that excite you in plastic reconstructive surgery? Yeah, so that's, a, you know, that, that's, a, that's a great question because I think there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of, I mean, there, especially when it comes to plastic surgery, is that, you know, there's always new things are coming out. You know, similarly to, I, I think a lot of uh, treatment options are now moving towards uh, essentially kind of the realm of uh, biologics, 
right? So, I mean, just like how cancer is now, you know, we're talking about target. I, I used to do a lot more kind of head and neck cancer reconstruction, but now a lot of these patients are now kind of treated with, you know, immunotherapy or these kind of targeted. Um, Interesting. And, and, and yeah, so plastic surgery, you know, it's not quite like that per se, but there are a lot of kind of things are things like, you know, stem cells and those kind of things have been, you know, talked about for a long time, right? So, but sure. now there are things like, for example, like exosomes, right, which are, is, is really hot right now. There's a, a lot of discussion, like I was just recently at a plastic surgery meeting, and that's one of the topics that was good. And actually, I'm about to go to another one next month, and the keynote speaker was one of the exosomes. Uh, person. Now, the issue with the exosomes right now is that it's not FDA approved therapy just yet, Okay. but it has been used in some other areas of a medicine because it's this whole area of essentially what we consider regenerative medicine, I think holds a lot of potential. But at the same time, I think it's an area that definitely needs to be kind of looked at and um, there needs to be some careful regulations. And I think it's very important also for us as providers, as physicians, as surgeons to kind of really essentially assess whether or not these treatments are really safe and then appropriate for right. our patients. Because, you know, our patients count on us to, to be their fiduciary and do what's best for them. Right. Sure. And I, I think it really kind of uh, uh, lies upon us to kind of do the due diligence to make sure that these therapies are, are well, obviously you want them to be effective, but first and foremost, to be safe. Right. So, uh, I, but at the same time, I think something like, you know, regenerative medicine, things like exosomes, stem cells, I think holds a lot of promise, but there definitely are still a lot to be done and to be studied about it. Thank you very much for that explanation and thank you very much for coming on Khan Clinics today and giving your insights. <laughs>